Thank you. Uh, it's easier. I was going to say it's a great honor to, to be here. This is my um, second um, visit to, to Krakow. Uh, the last time I visited, I and that wasn't too long ago. I had a very, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a long and private discussion with a, a citizen of Poland, an important person, but we, and then um, it was private. So um, it's an honor to be here to talk about those things also in public. Uh, I'm the second international judge who's speaking. I follow in the eminent footsteps of um, Judge uh, Fluger. Uh, as he said, we go to the international bench from a private, uh, sorry, from national backgrounds, and as the introduction says, I happen to have experience uh, as a lawyer in Nigeria and in Canada. And as you also know, uh, Nigeria and Canada have one thing in common amongst many, and uh, they're both derive their legal systems from the British legal system as uh, a feature of uh, colonial history. So I'll speak from those perspectives. Um, now, we're here to talk about judicial independence. I want to say up front that um, what I'm going to say will be largely descriptive to bring to your attention some thoughts others have expressed on this subject. Uh, I'll try not to be going overboard with opinions or e issuing them at all where possible. Uh, but when I do, those will be entirely my own opinions, not those of the ICC or any other judge of the ICC. Now, in his book of 1953, um, a very well-known Oxford scholar of his time, A. L. Goodhart, uh, in a book titled English Law and Moral, identified four cardinal principles of that form the bedrock or cornerstone of uh, British constitutionalism. Uh, those were no one is above the law, the rule of law. This is one principle. Uh, the next principle was free elections. The second. And the third one, freedom of speech. And the fourth cardinal principle of constitutionalism there, he identified as an independent judiciary, independence of the judiciary. He may have called them uh, bedrock or cornerstones of British constitutionalism, but I think we can all agree that there is nothing unique about those uh, precepts. Uh, nothing unique about them to England or UK. It is now ac accepted around the world, generally, uh, those four principles as standard cardinal principles of constitutionalism around the world. Uh, we will talk about judicial independence, the fourth cardinal principle. Now, speaking to that principle, he said as follows, let me quote, uh, it has been recognized as axiomatic that if the judiciary were placed under the authority of either the legislative branches or the government, then the administration of the law might no longer have that impartiality which is essential if justice is to prevail." Unquote. Now, the, the of course, we all have been saying that all along. As I said, what I'm going to do is take you through some of the utterances for principle to that effect. One other person who had said that in a classic 1932 article published in the Times was a famous uh, British jurist of his time as well, Sir William Holdsworth. Uh, in his essay, classically titled, quote, his Majesty's judges, unquote. There, he said something like this, and I'll quote. The judges hold an office to which is annexed the function of guarding the supremacy of the law. It is because they are the holders of an office to which 
the guardianship of this fundamental constitutional <laughs> principle is entrusted, that the judiciary forms one of the three great divisions in which the power of the state is divided. The judiciary was se has separate and autonomous powers just as truly as the king or parliament. And in the exercise of those powers, its members are no more in the position of servants than the king or parliament in the exercise of their powers." Unquote. Let me pause as a footnote. Uh, it may well be that some of the confusion seen, um, particularly I would say, we, we, this problem is not as much in common law jurisdictions as in continental Europeans. I've often had judges and uh, lawyers, and Judge Fluger told me it's no longer the case in Germany, but he, he said it used to be the case. I often heard judges and lawyers describe judges in Europe as civil servants. Uh, that can be confusing. Uh, if you are a civil servant, then somebody is your boss, and the person who is the boss of other civil servants might be tempted to think that they're your bosses too, and they start acting accordingly. That problem has been solved, that was never an issue really in, in uh, common law systems since about 17, uh, oh, 1700, the, the, the Act of Settlement in England that made quite clear that the judges are separate, um, an equal branch of government. So. I think that's something perhaps European judges need to think about, whether they continue to accept that they are civil servants in their systems, or whether they are as equal as the king or parliament are in their systems. Now, judicial independence is indeed the singular attribute that most determines the role of the judge as much as it characterizes it, it, it characterizes that role perhaps more so even than the requirement of professional training and experience because a person without a professional training and experience uh, with good conscience and independence of mind may be trusted to do justice at least at some level. So independence remains the primary, in my view, quality of the judicial office. Now, but what do we mean by judicial independence? Now, a uh, useful definition was provided, in my view, by Chief Justice Mason uh, of Australia. Uh, after he retired, he gave a paper somewhere to, to, to the Hong Kong legal system on judicial independence, where he defined the principle as follows. The principle of judicial independence has various aspects. In essence, it involves the capacity of judges to adjudicate fairly, free from direction, control, or pressure, or influenced by the legislative or executive arms of government or by any other source. So it doesn't matter the source from which pressure, control, direction, or influence comes, any such source has a risk of interfering with judicial independence. Of course, the most common forms of them would be interference from the executive and the legislature. But you also have difficulties with uh, big business as well. You have interferences or potential interferences from the media. I will speak about that in a moment uh, in detail. It can also have interference from criminal conduct, uh, be it from organized crime or uh, private individuals uh, trying to bribe judges. Whatever it is that will mortgage the freedom of conscience of a judge in the discharge of his functions is a risk to judicial independence. Judicial independence 
says the Supreme Court of Canada, must have at least two markers, two um, things that stand the, the standard of concept in any society. There must be independence in fact, and there must be, in fact, reasonable conditions in place to facilitate in the minds of the public the perception of independence in the judge. So independence, in fact, and in place features that will give the public confidence that judges do have judicial independence. Uh, we, I'm, gonna, I'm rambling on now to get to the, so I can finish on, on time. Uh, but one point I like to make whenever I speak about judicial independence is this. Now, beyond the uh, value, the over-important value, overarching value of judicial independence uh, to the rule of law, there is also an economic catch to be made for societies that aspire to greater economic development. Uh, there is a case to be made from the perspective of judicial independence for purposes of developing the economy. And that case was in fact made by no other person at first than Adam Smith himself, the father of political economy. In his classic, The Wealth of Nations, he makes that point. Uh, like other political economists of today, they will give you factors of uh, economy, good economy. He did the same in his book, The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. But then he continued, quote, quote, but above all, that, that equal, that equal and impartial administration of justice, which renders the rights of the lowliest subject to the greatest, and which by securing to every man the fruit of his own industry gives the greatest and most effectual encouragement to every sort of industry." Unquote. And he continues, and he continues to observe, quote, commerce and manufacturers can seldom flourish long in any state which does not enjoy a regular administration of justice in which the people do not feel themselves secure in the possession of their property, in which the faith of contracts is not supported by law, and in which the authority of the state is not supposed to be regularly employed in enforcing the payment of debts from all those who are able to pay." Unquote. So here, he continues to say, without rule of law, you cannot hope for long to have good economy. Uh, I will, I've got a note here to think about wrapping up, and I'm thinking about it. But one more quote from him to bring the point home, because he does specifically also address judicial independence. It's a long quote, but I, will, I think I should be able to finish it before my time is up. Please let me know when you finish the last five minutes. Now. Thank you. Here is Adam Smith again. When the judicial is united to the executive power, it is scarce possible that justice should not frequently be sacrificed to what is vulgarly called politics. The persons entrusted with the great interests of the state may, even without any corrupt views, sometimes imagine it necessary to sacrifice to those interests the rights of a private man, but upon the impartial administration of justice depends the liberty of every individual, the sense which he has of his own security. In order to make every individual feel himself perfectly secure in the possession of every right which belongs to him, 
it is not only necessary that the judicial should be separated from the executive power, but that it should be rendered as much as possible independent of that power. The judge should not be liable to be removed from his office according to the caprice of that power. The regular payment of his salary, that is the judge's salary, should not depend upon the goodwill or even upon the good economy of that power. That's the executive power of legislation, unquote. So there you have Adam Smith saying, if you want good economy, you have to do judicial independence. Now, briefly, and I'll wrap things up. Um, at the ICC, at the international level, uh, those props are in place, those features of you cannot remove a judge uh, without judges themselves passing it by a vote of two thirds majority of all the judges recommending to the assembly of states parties who will then vote again by two thirds majority in order to remove the judge. Uh, so it is not easy thing to remove an ICC judge in that regard. In Nigeria, where I come from, well, I think I have only time to touch on that briefly. In Nigeria, the judges are appointed by the president, the federal judges and senior judges, by the president, but upon the recommendation of the National Judicial Council. The National Judicial Council is made up of judges, chief justice of the country and other senior judges, and appointees of the bar. There's no minister in the, not even the attorney general is in the National Judicial Council. So they have to recommend who gets appointed to the president. I think that's all the time I have. Uh, if there's more questions, particularly on the ICC and how things work, I should be able to take them during question time. Thank you very much.